Well, as Steve said, I, uh, the, basically my experience with uh, shales started in graduate school when I was working on uh, the depositional environments of shales. Um, this is back when nobody particularly cared about them, but I thought, you know, there's a lot to be learned from them. And uh, I had to pretty much make, make it up as I went along, figuring out what I could do with them. And so I was looking at depositional environments, which meant looking at it, you know, basically in an outcrop and laboratory scale and uh, figuring out how the environments changed and what made them do that. And then uh, when I went to Exxon, I, I learned about uh, Eustacy and I was put in charge of doing the Paleozoic sea level curve because I was basically the only one with Paleozoic experience there. And uh, what the result of that was that I learned a lot about uh, why the shales looked the way they did, you know, given a eustatic context to them. And uh, a good deal of building the Paleozoic sea level curve was based on uh, where the shales were, the, particularly the black shales, because they give you a eustatic signal. And we'll talk about that a little bit as we go along. Um, but what I, I started off working on this, this project when I, 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 this project saying, you know, putting together this talk. Um, I was originally planning and put to, putting together a collection, an overview of where all the black shales were, just to show that there are a lot more out there than people have been drilling up. And uh, I realized that, yeah, that was actually a problem, is that there are an awful lot of them out there. And uh, then I tried to think about, well, what are the rules for looking at black shales and figuring out what they do? And I quickly came to the conclusion, well, there's not one rule, there's a whole, there's, there's different kinds of basinal black shales, and there are different ways to look at them. So I was, I'm going to give you a little bit of a view on, as to uh, one of, some of the things that I think apply to the, the black shales. This is uh, one of Donald Rumsfeld's <laughs> quotes. I think people have seen this, a lot of this lately, but the point I'm making is, is on the, the, the last sentence where he says, there are a lot of things we don't know we don't know. <laughs> and my point is that what I'm going to show you is a, is a number of things that uh, you probably don't know about interpreting shales. And so I'm, I'm, my mission tonight is to move some of these things from the, the things we don't know we don't know to the things that we should know that, you know, so we at least know that we don't know them. <laughs> And uh, to summarize what the current issues with organic rich mudstones, or at least this is my version, um, exploration for a new place is highly inefficient. Uh, people drill a whole lot of wells before they find a new play, or they just give up because they, they, they don't find what they're looking for. Um, they frequently wind up doing things to black shales because they figure they're all the same that aren't necessarily applicable in the situation that they're looking for. So they waste a lot of money uh, doing things that don't tell them anything. Um, too many wells are not profitable. And a lot of this, I think, requires the development of a more effective geological model. If you had some idea of uh, why the shell shales look the way they do and how they're distributed, um, you can make a lot better model and you know, do a lot better job of figuring out what the proper approach is in terms of what methodologies you'll use for exploring for them. And uh, down here, one of, one of the main problems, you know, at least from my perspective, is that there's a gap between this, the seismic and the na nanoscale. You see an awful lot of things published these days that are seismic scale and they say, well, look, you can see where the, the shale is on the seismic. Or they'll do something like doing uh, pore porosity on, on a, a nanoscale with your SEMs and so forth. But there's not a lot of uh, attention paid to the, the scale in between, the outcrop scale. Uh, there's a little bit of, of, of attention paid to the cores, but people don't know what to do with the cores. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about this. I'm not here to, to badmouth geophysics by any means, but I, I think one of the problems is that people have relied on geophysics and the problem is that it, it's so far removed 
from the depositional environments. Do you think you're, in order to predict or understand why the shales are like they are, you have to understand what's put into them, you know, why, to give you a predictable model. And, you know, the thing that you, freak, you sometimes see from your well logs are your rock properties, and even beyond that, the geophysics. So the geophysics are actually several steps removed from the actual uh, understanding the actual properties of the rocks, why the rocks are like they are. And so there's a couple steps of interpretation that are made between the geophysics and the, the actual rocks that you can model and predict. Uh, start off looking at the mega scale elements, which is basically uh, more or less the global or, or continental scale of things. This is where your used to see comes into play, but there are other things as well. Uh, long term trends, when you think about shales, uh, the black shales and particularly the organic rich mudstones, um, you know, they're, they're organic rich mudstones that go well back into the, the Precambrian. Uh, most of the North American ones are Paleozoic. Um, but over that time is that the organic matter that it's involved changes. For instance, um, basically in the, the end of the Devonian, the, the upper Devonian is when you first start getting land-derived organics. And so you think of your, your Ordovician uh, organic-rich mudstones like the Utica, they don't have any land-derived organics in them. Uh, clays actually probably changed very similarly because before you have land plants to hold down the, the soils and also provide the organic acids to, to, to break them down is that you don't get much lateritic weathering on shore. And cons this is also something that actually is observed is that when you get into the, the lower Paleozoic is that kaolinite is pretty rare. It's not to say it doesn't occur because you can get kaolinite by weathering volcanic ash and so forth, but it's a lot less common. So uh, as you go through time, there are things that even, even within the clays that, that the uh, environment changes. Uh, shelf productivity probably increases a lot as you go into the, the more recent, you know, the, the Mesozoic and on up into the Cenozoic. Uh, the the uh, quaternary part of the section is probably particularly productive. Um, we also have tectonics have a, a bearing on where your, your organic rich shales are de uh, deposited. It determines the overall thickness and stacking of some of these things as well as the maturation. Um, climate, you know, circulation and currents, sediment input have a lot to do with where you find these things. But used to see is, is perhaps the proximal reason for de the development of organic rich mudstones. And the reason I, I would say that is that um, used to see when you look at a, a given uh, sedimentary uh, section usually determines where the sedimentary <coughs> input is, is cut off and then you can see the expression of a black shale. Uh, the other thing that used to see typically does is that as you raise sea level, then it permits the, uh, the deeper water uh, facies to, to spill up onto the, uh, the shelf where you typically see these things. Uh, relationship of sediment types, uh, basically this is a, an onshore to offshore uh, gradient with this being onshore. Basically I'm just showing that there's more sediments close to shore and a diminishing amount of sediments as you go offshore. Uh, your onshore sources, siliciclastics, the carbonates are out on the shelf. And then out here you have the basinal deposits. And it's, it's perhaps fair to think of uh, basinal deposits of, as being separate from the siliciclastics. A lot of people over the, you know, through in the past have thought of, uh, you know, black organic rich mudstones as being sort of a subset of, of the siliciclastics. And that's probably not true, is that it probably should, is more accurately thought of as, as its own separate uh, subdivision, because it's got, a, they've got their own characteristics and some of them are uh, interfingered with carbon as, as much as they are with siliciclastics. Oops. This is another way to look at them, that the color code here is that um, just 
you know, it's, it's a rough color code. Yellow is for the shallow water deposits. The brown is for the uh, more basinal black shale facies. And the, uh, the purple is actually for non-deposition. It's for star starvation. And what you can see here is that if you have the, the same signal, is that in a basinal sitting, you may have the expression of a, a single organic rich mudstone with some hiatus, hiatuses within it, given the cycles, that may be expressed, um, it's expressed much differently up on the craton, and in fact, you'll have a lot of section missing. Um, the fact is that even though initially they don't look like they correlate, they in fact do. They, they're telling you something about, uh, this section tells you what your structure is like over here and vice versa. And in fact, this is one of the ways I put together the, the, the sea level curve, is that if, if you compare your, uh, your section in a basinal setting compared to what you see on a craton, it tells you a lot about how they relate to each other. This is another diagram uh, kind of expressing the same thing. This is a, a prograding shelf. Again, it's kind of got the same color, uh, kind of color code. The uh, light blue is the, uh, sh the shelf facies, the, the dark blue is the, the slope. The brown is the uh, basinal organic rich mudstone, and again, the purple would be actually a hiatus or missing section. And if you looked at it, if you drilled a well here on the, uh, the, shelf, the edge of the shelf, you can see that you'd see a couple tongues from the higher frequency uh, cycles within there and a, a thicker black shale down here at the bottom. Uh, you might see a little bit of shelf here up at the top. Whereas if you drilled through the same uh, section off in the basin, basically all you might see the toes of one of these uh, prograding shelves, but it's both mostly going to be a continuous uh, black shale with some, some gaps in it, some hiatuses within it. Um, again, it's, it's time-wise, it's the same section, it's just m more out into the basin, and it's going to be largely basinal deposits. This is an example from uh, the Silurian of North Africa that shows kind of how this works. The Tanazuft, of course, is the Silurian uh, black shale of North Africa. And what you see here, the, the dashed lines are the, the, the stratigraph, the sequence boundaries. And then you see that the flooding surface is up above here. The numbers are, are graptolite zones, are Silurian graptolite zones. And they are actu from actual wells along this section. One of the things you can't see that's, that's here is that right in here, um, there's a condensed section uh, where there's actually a number of graptolite zones missing. And this corresponds to the, uh, the Silurian high stand. In other words, at, at during the, the middle of the Silurian, it's basically the lower half of the Wenlock. Um, it was completely condensed out and there's no deposition. Uh, at this point, in the section, as I recall, there's, there's a radioactive uh, marker, very high radioactive marker in this condensed section. And again, what, it, what it's showing is that uh, there's basically no deposition there. You know, people have interpreted that as being an unconformity, but it's actually a hiatus. It's a non-depositional surface. These are some of our, the Pennsylvanian cyclothems, uh, ones that I worked on. Um, you can see the black shale right here, and this is the same black shale out in New Mexico sitting down here, I guess right at the arrow. Um, it's the same eustatic cyclothem. You can demonstrate this by uh, the biostratigraphic control. It's got the same uh, offshore fauna in it. It's a little bit de better developed here in Iowa simply because this is probably a little bit farther up on the, the slope toward the Pedernal uplift. Um, you can tell that this is also actually a little thicker section. Uh, he's about six feet tall, and that's a, a three-foot uh, yardstick there. But again, it's this, the same eustatic cycle over, um, uh, well, what is that, 800,000 kilometers. And showing you kind of the same thing again is uh, the Pennsylvanian cyclothems comparing Kansas to Utah, the Paradox Basin. And again, basically in the offshore facies, you see the, the core black shale uh, with the same conodonts in it. 
Uh, the regressive limestones are very similar with phylloid alkyl mounds. In Utah, you get evaporites during the low stand. There's an exposure surface in Kansas. And when you look down here at the, the, the early transgression, this is a backfilled uh, river channels with a transgressive coal sitting on top of it. Out in Utah, this is usually Aeolian sandstones. This is what the, the expression of the uh, Eustace does for the Bakken. You have a lower uh, basinal Bakken. You have the middle Bakken, which is relatively shallower facies mosaics. Uh, the deposition is slow enough that you don't have uh, a continuous facies. This is one of the, the, the issues that a lot of people have is that, particularly for transgressive intervals, they're usually so starved um, that you see a facies mosaic. You'll see different facies in different places. And so waving your hands at them and trying to make it all be the same facies or, or exactly time correlative is usually not the correct decision. Um, the point being is that uh, because it's a facies mosaic is that you, you, you have a harder time predicting the lateral facies changes in this particular interval. And then, of course, you have the, the, the upper Bakken goes back into the basinal facies. If you put a sea level curve on it, it looks kind of like this. Um, I'm, to a certain extent, I'm waving my hands at it. The, the lower Bakken appears to be slightly more basinal in that the conodonts are in, in worse shape. They look like they, the, the rate of deposition is a lot lower. And I think the lower Bakken is aerially more extensive. And again, it turns out that the, uh, the Devonian Mississippian boundary is right there in the, between them. Uh, again, you can correlate this to a number of different basins and, and see how it's expressed in different basins. So Eustace can help predict the stratigraphic interval where an organic rich mudstone may be found, as well as estimate the, uh, the distribution of the organic rich facies. Turning to the, the mesoscale uh, characteristics, they determine the internal geometry and characteristics, and they're important for several reasons, uh, particularly the distribution and input of organic material. Um, the, uh, it determines the reservoir properties from the detrital sediments. Let's see. Input. Yeah, I'll just flip through these. Um, and again, it, it determines the, the, the rock characteristics um, as well as the, you know, the other properties with, within the rocks that are, you're concerned with. The relationship to adjacent units is important. Um, how, they, you know, how the packages are put together and particularly when you start thinking about things like frackability, is what, what are the limits of your frackable packages? Uh, one of the other characteristics that we need to talk about in terms of the, uh, the mesoscale is episodicity. And I use the, the, the term episodicity rather than periodicity because at least to me, periodicity implies recurring on a regular or semi-regular basis. And in these basinal situations, you may have events that happen every once in a while, but they, they may be a long ways from being uh, periodic. And they can all even come from different, uh, uh, different mechanisms. And this, this <laughs> gives you an example. The point here is that this is one of the, one of the uh, kind of events that happens. But, um, you know, most of you are familiar enough with sedimentation that you realize that in most sedimentary packages and depositional packages, you know, most of what goes on there goes in a, on in a very short period of time and then basically nothing happens for the rest of the time. And even with a hurricane on the, the Gulf Coast, something like this, is that the thing that's actually going to leave you a record is when, when the, the eye or the region right around the eye impacts that particular area. So if you're looking at a, 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 a section, offshore section or a shallow water section, you'll see maybe when the last time an eye went fairly close to this place, and then there's not going to be a whole lot of record from anything else. 
So you have to figure out, well, what's the frequency of an eye passing over this particular area? It's not the, the frequency of hurricanes in this area. It's the frequency of the smaller uh, air volume that, that actually does the damage. This shows the um, dust storm coming off the, the Sahara. And the point from this is that this is also episodic, but it also it impacts the deep basin. In other words, it's, even if you get out into the deep water and you say, well, hurricanes you know, only influence the, the, the bottom down to 100 meters or so, is that even if you're out in the middle of the Atlantic here, you're still getting things that happen that may happen periodically or episodically. Um, you know, you could also think about things like earthquakes and so forth. There, there are things that, that do impact the deep basin, and they only impact it occasionally. And uh, this is basically, this shows you how uh, recurrence intervals work. If you take a set of data uh, from a particular event, and I'm, I made this generic so it doesn't apply to any particular event, but you'll have a frequency that, that will allow you to pr um, develop a regression. This happens to be, if, if you're paying attention, it's semi-log down here it's and uh, logarithmic along the bottom and uh, linear along the side. And the, the point is, is that um, you can calculate, once you plot these things, your 10-year event and your 100-year event. And the point is that up here you have at least theoretically a 1,000-year event. Um, you know, you can argue about the, the validity of, of projecting things out that far, but the whole, the whole point is here is that there are infrequent events and, you know, if you have a section that represents a million years of sedimentation, you might have, you know, you could potentially have a, a one in a million year event out there. And it's, the, the point is that it, it would be a big one and it might do a lot, of, a lot more than all these things put together. And again, this is kind of an expression of how that works. Um, this would be a steady state deposition down here if you just dumped in a little all the time. You might have your million year event does all this, or maybe you have a series of you know, infrequent events but still more frequent than a million year event. You know, maybe you had base level change a little bit or climate perturbation and you get a little bit more sedimentation. But the idea is that the area beneath these from these, these individual events is basically the same as the, the area underneath this slow but steady sedimentation. And the whole point is that when you start looking at these things is that the average sedimentation doesn't explain what you see. And one of the, the ways this, this comes back is when you look at the uh, uh, basinal deposition, which is the, the, the purple, you, know, you have disoxic deposition, and again, the yellow is the shallow. In this particular environment, you have a lot of shallow water deposition interrupted by you know, brief pulses of, of basinal deposition. And this one down here, you have basically prevailing disoxic low oxygen deposition with brief intervals of uh, shallow water deposition. And of course, the, the sections are going to look a lot different. This is an expression of one of these events, one of your infrequent events. This is a uh, phosphate oud uh, grainstone from the Makokata Formation in northeast Iowa. These are primary phosphate ouds, and they express express. Uh, basically a depositional hiatus start, uh, sedimentation was starved to the point where you don't even have organic debris that's, that's accumulating here. Um, essentially, you know, it's, it's sitting right on top of a hard ground. The black stuff up here is a combination of pyrite cement and uh, organic material as you actually get sedimentation started again. And presumably if this, if the, the thing that caused the, the sediment starvation here was a, a sea level rise, which you know is a pretty good chance of it. You can probably correlate that into the Utica. It's, it's uh, same time and same uh, broad depositional environment. Turning to paleontology, 
the events that we've been talking about, of course, have a paleontological expression. Um, the difference being is that the paleontology that you see is actually typically more of an event. It's something that happens that may, may or may not be persistent. Um, and in these organic rich mudstone environments, a lot of times the faunal significant signal is an event. And the geochemistry, as we were just talking about, is, is a more long-term background uh, signal. And typically in, in these black shales, the, the bio biological events are shale beds, burrowed zones, and so forth. And you can uh, do biophases and zonations based on the kind of uh, fossils that you find within these event beds. Uh, the quality and quantity of the, the, the organisms is informative. This is what part of this, if you think about it, is what I refer to as the, the preservation paradox. You know, some of you are pr probably familiar with the, the, the black shales that have, you know, the compression faunas, the, 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 the black sh the sharks and so forth in them. And they always talk about, well, it's an anoxic environment, very still water, and the sharks just died and settled to the bottom. Well, if you think about that for a minute, you say, I'm probably not seeing all the sharks that lived in that environment. I'm probably seeing a very small percentage of the sharks that were actually out there. And even when you're talking about things like conodonts, the conodont animals, you're probably only seeing a very small percentage of them. So you say, well, how come I see some of them that are, have this really nice preservation, but I'm not seeing all of them? And the, the conclusion is that it still takes an event of some kind to, to bury these things and keep them preserved so that they're just not you know, dissolving into the exposed, as they're exposed to seawater. And again, this comes back to the point that people frequently overlook is that um, virtually all shales are fossiliferous to some degree or another. And this particularly apl applies again to organic rich mudstones. They're organic rich for a reason. You know, that <laughs> and so, uh, one, of, one of the points I would make is that if you don't look at the, 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 the critters that are in these shales, you're just throwing away one of the most basic pieces of information you've got about them. And this shows, this is kind of an example of how this works. This is a, uh, the conodonts that I worked on in the, the Pennsylvania cycle of them. So you don't need to worry about the names or anything, but it shows the principle. Is, Keep in mind that the conodont animal was nectonic. It, it didn't sit down on the bottom. And so it, it's out here inhabiting the different water masses. So the ones that live close, you know, up near the surface that also extended onshore, you know, you had a shallow water uh, fauna. Then you had an intermediate fauna. And so the, the, the sediments that were deposited in the shallow water just had this guy uh, the ones as you move farther out would have more and more of this guy. And as you got into deeper water, you know, close to the uh, uh, oxygen minimum level down here, you'd get the, the deep water guys. And even out here where you had an anoxic water column close to the bottom, you'd still have all these guys that lived up above there that settled down in here. So you could, you could basically have a, a scale of how uh, deep the water is by what kind of conodonts you had in them. And you'd also get a rough measurement of how fast this was deposited simply because there's a whole lot less sedimentary uh, dilution out here than there is up here. And just to give you an idea of what these things look like, um, these are from my dissertation. These guys here are the, the intermediate guys that live in the, the, the stable limestone producing environment. Um, and the point I'm making here is not that you have to be a really fancy paleontologist to figure out what these things are. In fact, the opposite is true is that for doing biophages on these things, you know, the generic level is good, but all you need to do is find, figure out what these guys look like. If you wanted to do biostratigraphy, these are the guys you'd work with. But what we're looking at, these are the t uh, deep water conodonts. And 
you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you can see that these guys look different from these guys. It's not real hard to tell them apart. So that, that's the kind of level you need to work with. And of course, the, the nice thing about Conan is that you can get them out of everything. So um, we'll come back to that in a minute. These are the, uh, the forams that are looking at. Most of these guys are calcareous forams. These are the agglutinated forams down here at the bottom. And these are the guys that uh, lived in the most uh, dysaerobic facies before you actually got to the, the anoxic black shales. And keep in mind that the guys, the, the organisms that lived in that kind of environment are controlled by the physical uh, variability. In other words, because the oxygen level is, is unstable, uh, these guys would, would proliferate when they could and then they'd, they'd get killed off when the oxygen disappeared. And consequently, in order to survive in an, an environment like that, you have to be pretty conservative. You can't go off, you know, evolving some fancy uh, biological dependency on something that doesn't ever show up. So basically looking at these guys gives you a measurement of how disoxic the environment was. And again, these guys are very conservative. In fact, uh, the genera that these are assigned to in, in the Pennsylvanian are still extant. Uh, genera, at least they look the same. You can argue about whether they're actually the same or not. Um, but again, when, the, when you see the papers that talk about uh, the agglutinated forams that they see associated with the, with the black shales, these are the guys they're talking about. And again, um, this is kind of a summary. This is, this is a little bit more elaborate diagram. The, the only point I want to make with this is the fact that as you go deeper into the, into the uh, offshore environment and you have the, the different critters, as I said, they're all uh, controlled by the physical environment. And so you can actually zone them. You know, this, I, I put together kind of an arbitrary zone. You could actually make a zone for the distribution of each one of these and, and you know, make it as coarse or as fine as you wanted to. But you could, you could zone what you find in the black shales and map it out. So you could figure out where the, the center of the basin is and how it graded laterally, which way it was grading what different facies based on what you find in it. Uh, burrowed shelly layers are something we talk about. You've, there's, there's been quite a few papers on this at some of the meetings lately. If you start off with a uh, organic rich shale deposition or organic rich mudstone and then it gets a burrowed interval in it and then you get maybe another interval of, of uh, organic rich mud and another burrowed interval and you repeat that. The thing that's significant is that if they're discrete they must be episodic because if they if if you didn't have episodicity going on they just homogenize the sediment and they, everything would be burrowed up. So in order to recognize them as discrete intervals is that it would have to be something that only happened once in a while rather than continuously. And this is one of the things you need to think about when you look at black shales that the burrowed zones don't inter represent what's going on out there most of the time. They represent what's going on there occasionally. Same with the, the shelly zones. And uh, the other thing is that the intervals that are deposited, again, the depositional units must be thick enough that they're thicker than the individual burrowed zone on top of them. So that if your burrowed zone was, say, two centimeters thick, then the, the sediment package that was deposited uh, between these burrowing intervals would have to be, you know, at least two centimeters thick for, in order for you to recognize them. Time between intervals is unknown. Um, the depositional environments events may or may not be accompanied by oxic events, and you can't have erosion. This is just uh, some bout cal bout back calculations I made on these to, to give you some idea. One of the things that in order to um, preserve Shelley fossils, the estimate was that you had to have uh, at least 10 centimeters per thousand years deposition in order to keep them from being dissolved by sitting around in the bottom. Uh, these are some of the rates 
from various black shales. Note that down here in the lower barnet, uh, the, the rate figured out to um, two and a half millimeters per thousand years, and lower Bakken it's one to three uh, millimeters per thousand years. Now, if you stop and think about that for a minute, and going back and saying, well, you know, I know that the lower Bakken has shelly intervals and burrowed intervals in it. You say, well, the individual episodes, you know, again, if they produced two centimeters per individual episode, and you say your average uh, depositional rate is well below that, then in order for it to fit within your, your average, is that if you, if you deposited a two centimeter depositional interval, then you meet, that means for like 10 or 20,000 years, you have to have nothing at all happening out there to keep your, your average up. So that again, in an environment like that, if you have episodic deposition, it implies that there's an awful lot of time going on out there when, when nothing's happening. And this is one of the things that that's, you, you have to grasp when you're looking at, at these, these basin and shales is that nothing is an option in terms of sedimentation. And again, these, these things are episodic. Um, this is one of the things that as you read through the literature again, people talk about having erosional unconformities and talking about ripples and this, that, and the other thing, and they're, they're trying to tell you that, oh, this shows you that there's a lot more energy out there than we thought there was. Well, it just tells you that once in a while there's a lot more energy out there than, than they, you thought there was, but it's probably still not the prevailing environment. This, that's the, that's the, the record of the, the occasional or episodic things that happened out there. Another thing to keep in mind when you're looking at these that you can get out of these, these facies interpretations is that it makes a difference what shape the, the curves are. Um, if you had a sea level rise and fall that was basically, you know, again, I tend to think of them as being very sharp because depositionally they tend to have a sharp base. You know, it, it may come back very quickly to a, a shallow water deposition so you get a very sharp curve. Um, it could come back gradually. And of course, this is going to make a difference in how these black shales respond if you're out there looking for, to frack them or whatever, because again, th if this one is a, having a sharp base and a sharp uh, top. It's probably going to con confine your, your fracking energy very tightly into that interval. This one's going to grade up, and it's going to be hard to find something that's you know, going to confine it up, up above not to mention the fact that you're going to have a gradational properties on top. Um, you might actually get something that spends a lot of time being non-deposited and then just coming back at the end. Or you could actually get something that was actually a, a series of very high frequency cycles. And, you know, again, it, 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 the, the, the shape of the curve, the distribution of the curve, makes a difference in how these things are, are, are going to respond in terms of uh, your exploration expectations and how you're going to, you can, you can think of it if, you, if you're going to develop a black shale that was actually a series of high frequency cycles like this, it's going to be a problem. You're going to have to think about that. Organic m matter, this is one of the things you need to think about is that um, a lot of shales, the black shales, when they describe them, they just say, well, we'll tell you what the TOC is. And you know, that's, that's really not good enough because, um, you know, different organic matter types respond differently. Humic material is much more, uh, land-derived humic material is much more resistant than marine organics. And the composition can change within an ind individual shale, vertically as well as horizontally. And that's, that can pretty much, that can make a difference anyway. And in terms of modeling these, you can think of your, your or as you're doing your organic rich maturation models and so forth. Um, a lot of the models, you know, they, they calculate a bulk model for um, hydrogen index and so forth and, and the various properties. And they basically say, well, we've got one uh, organic matter type here that's got intermediate properties and they model it as one. And you can make an argument that if you've got two different organic matter types, maybe, you're, maybe you should appropriately model it as 
being a physical mixture of two different organic matter types. And um, in relation to this, when uh, Bohax and others were talking about the parameters that they, they thought were important in determining the amount and type of organic matter, they looked at production, dilution, and destruction, which are perfectly fine, but I think they, didn't, they did not address the importance of importation, in other words, stuff that was brought in from somewhere else. You know, for instance, land-derived material. And they didn't uh, address the importance of episodicity. In other words, you know, with, when you have episodic deposition, the, the critical factor is rather, rather than the average rate of deposition, it's sort of the instantaneous rate of deposition, is whatever happens that actually buries the sediment and uh, what the characteristics of that, that event are. are. And the other th another thing that's important in looking at uh, these basinal shales is the impact of ultra-rich source areas. Now, if you're familiar with carbonates, you know that you have things let, that are high flow zones. And they'll completely dominate uh, the productive capacity of a particular carbonate unit. And it's probably true that in uh, organic-rich mudstones that this is important, too. You can say, um, if you think about it, you say, well, is it better to have 10 meters of 2% TOC shale or 2 meters of 10% TOC shale? And I'm basically making the argument that it's, it's the good stuff that makes the difference. That's what makes your sweet spots, is having more of the good stuff. So that rather, rather than just finding an area where it's, it's just kind of creeping into the, uh, uh, you know, up over the edge of being good enough to, to, to generate hydrocarbons at all, what you want to do in your exploration is locate where the good stuff is. This is kind of a, a little sketch diagram showing it. Um, you're going from onshore to offshore. Onshore, you have more oxidation in the shallow water. You have more siliciclastic input. Your marine organics set offshore, and your terrestrial organics uh, come from onshore. And the point is, is that out in this area, you may be running out of siliciclastic input, but your shale, your organic-rich material may be a mixture of, of the resistant uh, terrestrial organics mixed in with your marine organics. And uh, as it turns out, the Pennsylvania cyclothems are a good example of this. Um, this is the, one of the cyclothems. And this is, that's a yardstick there, so this is probably about four meters thick. The top of the regressive limestone is right about here. This is about a two meter soil profile. That's the uh, transgressive coal. There's a shallow marine uh, carb, uh, calcareous shale. And up in here, this the resistant ledge is the uh, thistle black shale. And you can see some of the chunks of it that have fallen down here and slid down the slope. Um, very rich in organics, but it's mostly terrestrial organics. And it's an offshore facies. This is uh, the data from another cycle them and what you actually see here draw a line across at the uh, this would be the maximum flooding surface and you can see that the uh, TOC here is, is very high it's about 40 percent um, the humic percentage starts off pretty high about 30 percent and diminishes as you go up through the cycle the uh, maximum flooding is about right in here. You can see it's got the, the, the most conodonts in it. And you've also got the, mo the highest percentage of the offshore conodonts. The point being is that just above the maximum flooding zone is, is basically you're concentrating the, you have the, the lowest rate of deposition and you're actually concentrating the land derived organics as a, as a percentage of the, the organics so that you go farther up, the water depth may actually reach a maximum, you know, somewhere in here, or, or it would be more marine organics farther offshore before it starts shallowing up into the, the following cycle. But um, this is uh, basically, again, where the highest TOC is here, where it's most starved. This is another example of how that this works. This is a uh, Pennsylvania black shale from Indiana. 
And again, uh, this is a very highly fissile black shale. It's a paper shale. And it's non-calcareous and non-silicious. The facility comes from the, the land-derived organics in it, which can also give you facility. Uh, these little white things are secondary fillings to molds of pectin. So this represents uh, one of these biological events here. And to give you an idea, from the, the same environment out in New Mexico, these are the same guys. There's a, a Dunbarella right here, and then there's another one that's a little harder to see that's up here. And again, one, one of the points here that a lot of people overlook is that organic-rich black shales have moldic porosity. You can get moldic porosity in these things, and it can be important. And this is one of the, the aspects of, of shales that people kind of wave their hands at and pretend, you, you know, it's, there's a one-size-fits-all is the idea of facility, which you could also look at as um, horizontal frackability. In other words, what's its ability to hor uh, frack horizontally, which is, of course, what you want to do with it. Um, and the thing is that you can make facility in a lot of different ways. You can use it, you know, gravitation is one, uh, orientation of flat, various flat particles, um, even plate bioclass as we saw with the, uh, the pectins. Um, you can also do it from compaction, uh, lamination, in other words, depositional or alternation, uh, currents, and of course, tectonism. So the point is that you can get a tendency to frack, uh, to, to split horizontally in a number of different mechanisms and just sort of waving your hands at it and saying, well, we've got this value, therefore it's got this resistance to, to, to fracture for this reason. Probably doesn't work because the fracturing, the ability to fracture horizontally may come from a, a number of different properties and they're not going to be physically related. This kind of uh, summarizes, again, the reservoir properties. You can have silicification. The thing about silicification of, of your reservoirs is that it can, that again, can come from a number of different sources. You can't just look at a shale and say, well, it's got this n amount of silica in it, and that tells me how frackable it is. Well, the thing is that if you have detrital silica in there, it's going to have a lot of different properties that if it's biogenic or even volcanic or diagenetic or what have you. So you need to know something about where your silica is coming from. Same actually applies to carbonates. Um, the uh, carbonate people will, will rag on you for saying, describing something as a marl, which probably most of you do, um, just because that's the way things are described in the literature. Uh, the significant uh, distinction is that a marl can be either have skeletal debris in it, which will have discrete skeletal grains, or can be diagenetically distributed, can be cemented. And calling it a marl doesn't tell you diddly about how the carbonate's spot distributed within that, that shale. Uh, again, you can have moldic porosity as part of your, uh, the burrowing events will contribute to the um, uh, porosity and permeability. Again, the epicidicity and, con and uh, contact uh, relationships and all these can contribute to the, your reservoir property. So all these are parameters you need to think about when you're trying to describe and predict what your reservoir properties are going to be like. This is just a reminder, uh, again, from a radiolarian. This is uh, a radiolarian in Kansas, which is, again, supposed to be well up on the shelf, but you've got a radiolarian, which most of us think of as being at least relatively deep water. But the other significant thing is that this is completely replaced by phosphate. And that tells you that the silica that originally made up this radiolarian has gone somewhere else. And it's just a reminder that, you know, these, these things move around. You have to think about where that, that went. Uh, mineralogy, in coarse clastics, which are like sandstones, you have relatively simple mineralogy. Carbonates are a little bit more complex, but not a whole lot more complex. When you talk about mudstones and shales, you've actually got a bunch of different uh, mineral phases that, that are present, and, and it becomes a lot more complex, but 
you need to understand what the mineralogy is, is that's there. And a lot of times they don't really give you a good feeling for, for what they, all, they are, but uh, the mineralogy for the mudstones can be pretty complex. In clay mineralogy, uh, I think I'll um, see if I can't get you through this without putting you completely asleep. Uh, I, I would argue that the clay mineralogy is important in, in terms of looking at the shales. And particularly, I think clays basically hit above their weight. In other words, people say, you know, the, the, the standard sedimentological division is that, oh, it has to be 50% in order for it to be a, a clay stone. And if you wait until it's 50%, you've, you've missed the point. Is that Clays are significant, you know, I basically I'd say from my own experience is that if you get over 10% of a, of, of a rock is, is clay, it's important, it's significant. And if it gets to be over like 20% of the, the, the rock is that the clays are going to dominate the, the physical properties and chemical properties of that rock. And the clays, the detrital clays, which are very rarely looked at, because most, most of the clay mineralogy you see that's done in the industry is, is oriented toward diagenesis. They'll, they'll, they'll show you the neat, neat, neat little pictures of the, the clay booklets and the pore spaces. Uh, the detrital clays can tell you something about the use to see, the provenance, climate, and even the age of the rock. And it can also be size dependent, which is one of the things that they, again, they don't, they usually just give you one number and say, this is the clays. Um, Particularly the detrital clays, the coarser, coarser grain fraction, kaolinite, for instance, is a lot coarser than, than the other clays. And so, you know, if you, if you look at the less than two micron fraction, say this is the clays, you're skewing the, the results. Um, bulk rock XRD is inadequate for distinguishing many clay minerals. Uh, you can't do glycolation or DTA or anything like that on your bulk clay, so that, again, a lot of people just do clays. They say, well, we've got this number, and it's the clays, and we'll, we've checked off that box. We've looked at the clays. Uh, they haven't gotten any information out of it. Um, illite crystallinity. Uh, this is one of the things that, that I learned uh, on looking at these things that is generally overlooked, and I'll go into that for a minute, as to why it's important. Um, the, the idea is that... Um, if you have expandable clays and they convert into illite at depth, the conventional wisdom is that in order to make that conversion, and I'll flip on to, well, I got this, the story is out of, out of order just a little bit, but I'll do this quickly. What this is showing you is that this is uh, a cyclothem in, from Kansas. In the near shore section where you've got detrital material in, Coming into the section, you've got detrital kaolinite, detrital uh, mu uh, muscovite in here. Sea level rises, and that's cut off by a sea level rise because all this stuff is coming from the Oachitas and the Appalachian Basin. It's cut off by sea level rise, and you don't see it in the marine part of the section. So that the clay mineralogy here reflects uh, eustacy. Uh, coming back to what I was, I was going to talk about, the potassium uptake in kaolinite is, or in illite is important. And the reason it's important is because um, it governs when the, the, the chemical change takes place. As you, as you go from an expandable clay, a, 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 like montmorillonite to illite, the idea is that you release silica to the environment and you take up aluminum. And the idea is that with burial, and you, if you undergo this illitization through burial, you should be releasing silicate into these shales that can go somewhere else and cement up your shales. So it's important whether that happens or not. It's also important because some of the, mo as they, they go along with this, is that as you close up your expandable clay into an illite, uh, you expel water, it gives you a pulse of water to move out into this section. And at least according to some ideas that if there's hydrocarbons that are in those interlevel sites, they're forced out too. And that during diagenesis of these things, you should not only have 
silica being dumped out into the, the environment. You may also have water and uh, uh, hydrocarbons being dumped out into the, the environment. That's why that's important. So where does the potassium come in? Well, we'll get to that. Just a second. I'll show you. I'll show you a diagram, and I'm getting to that. Um, so what we act, what I actually observed is that there's potassium uptake versus illitization. I was observing this illitization that took place at surface conditions, and according to the conventional clay wisdom, that's not supposed to happen. You're not supposed to be able to do that. If you dump According to the conventional wisdom, if you dump an expandable clay into the ocean, because it takes enough energy to activate the, the, the changeover, the structural changeover, it has to be buried and heated. And that's not what I saw. I saw this happening at surface conditions. And the only way that that, that could happen, and I think I'll just flash through this, because uh, I've, I've explained most of this already, um, this is a summary diagram. You can either have go from a, a, a Montmorillonite type structure to an illite structure. And again, you see if, as you go from here, you're losing silica and replacing it with aluminum. But it's a structural change. Um, alternately, you can have something where if you just take out the potassium through soil processes, maybe it's plants you know, taking up potassium, they'll strip out the potassium and there'll be water in there. And that'll behave as, a, as a, an expandable clay. So far as an x-ray analysis is, is concerned, these guys and these guys are the same. But this one, because you're not actually changing the, uh, the, the structure, and I'm, I'm trying not to get real involved in the clay, the clay structure, but basically you're not changing this part, you're just changing out, out the ions in there. Um, is that that, basic, that change can basically go back and forth at surface conditions. And this one requires burial. This one would not release silica to the environment. So it's important as to which one it is. And for instance, again, coming back to our friends, the, the Pennsylvania cyclothems, this is the one I worked on in Iowa. And there again is the, the, the flooding surface at the top of the, the coal here. And what you see here, the, the red line is, is the uh, average value. The, the green shaded area is a standard deviation on each side of that. And what you can see is that in this weather profile, the, the clay becomes, the alike crystallinity is progressively degraded up, toward the co up to the coal. And so it's becoming degraded by the, the plant activity up in here. And then as you get out into the marine environment, the alike crystallinity in, increases. And it's actually basically reaches its maximum in here in the black shale and the, the underlying gray shale before you go back up into the limestone. And so what you're actually seeing is that the, the light crystallinity is increasing because it's, you know, deposition is slower, but it's sitting on the bottom and it's having more time to interact with the seawater. And so you're, you're actually getting a signal from this. And if this was a, bi a diagenetic event, you wouldn't see that at all. It would all be homogenized. And so this is telling you that, yeah, you actually are getting something that's happening at surface conditions. And, you know, as, as I was explaining, this happens because you're just moving the, the potassium back in and out of this, this structure without having to alter the clay structure. But the, again, this is important because in terms of your, your shales as they develop and they undergo diagenesis, you're going to want to know wh whether they have a potential to give you silica for cement. And this one wouldn't. If you, if you took some of this, uh, these clays and buried them, you're not going to get any extra silica out of the deal. Uh, failure of events. This is, I, I had a question about this earlier, and we are actually getting close to the end, of, <laughs> in case you're wondering. Um, this is a corrosion zone of middle artivation. What you see is uh, solution, carbonate deposition stopped and you're getting the, the, the surface corroded. And this is all enriched in pyrite and so forth. And so basically what you're looking at is that you have net loss of carbonate in the section. And one of the things over the last 20 years or so that this, this has been interpreted as, 
being evidence for cold water deposition. Well, the problem is that in, in the mid-continent at this time is that you're pretty much on the equator, and you also have deposition of evaporites in the Williston Basin. So chances are is that it's not actually cold water. What it's telling you is that it's undersaturated because the difference, you know, basically the, the determination that it's cold water is, is because it's undersaturated. And that's the actual observation they're making. And a possible ex a, a argument is that the lower Paleozoic carbonate shells just weren't as productive as they are later on. And, and, and you say, well, maybe your carbonate compensation depth was a lot shallower during the, the lower Paleozoic than it became, you know, as, as you go through the Mesozoic and on to the Cenozoic, it becomes progressively deeper. And that's largely because of the, the productivity of the carbonate producing organisms. And when you go back into the Ordovician, uh, you don't even have, you know, calcareous microplankton floating around. <coughs> Most of the Ordovician plankton, so far as we know, is organic walled, you know, chitin and so forth. But basically what you, what you apparently see is that periodically, um, you know, maybe sea level deepened a little bit and you had the, the carbonate compensation depth came up onto the shelf and you had a corrosion zone. Well, this is important uh, when you get into something like this. This is sort of a glorified corrosion zone. You can see the pyrite and so forth. This is uh, about a two inch thick oil shale. Uh, nice brown, very organic rich. Uh, you can light it. Um, the, as I understand it, the local farmers, when they drilled through this, they'd get an oil sheen and they wondered if they'd hit oil in, in the area. And then it's got on top of it this, about this three inch interval. This is one of the uh, Ordovician potassium bentonites. And uh, it's one of the most widespread bentonites. There's the, the, the Deakey bentonite, which is this one, and the Millbrig, which is pretty much the same thing. But what you, again, what you see is uh, apparently a corrosion surface, and you've got this black shale and this bentonite expressed on top of that. And what that means, there, there are two ways to think about this. You know, if you, if you see a, uh, an ash bed in a, in a stratigraphic interval, it can either be like this, is that if you think of a constant steady rain of volcanic ash into a section, and you project over that carbonate deposition, and say something disrupts that carbonate deposition, say a sea level rise or something like that, it's going to be expressed as an ash bed, that particular event. The other way, which is the more conventional way, is that if you have a volcanic event that gives you an increased influx of volcanic material, and you have your basic background, say carbonate deposition, you'll get a, again, you'll get an ash bed out of the deal. But, so the, the point is that an ash bed can be either suppression of the prevailing sedimentation, or it can be an increase in, in the input of volcanic ash. Well, if you look at something like the uh, Mount St. Helens ash fall, you know, it has a very pronounced downwind footprint to it. It's very, very low bait. Uh, this is a Miocene one. This is one that uh, killed a herd of uh, oreodonts in eastern Nebraska over here. And again, it's very elongate in the direction of prevailing winds. In contrast, if you look at one of these Ordovician bentonites, and this is supposedly, this is where it's thickest, and they, so they figure the, the locus for this particular one must have, or the, the source vent must have been down here. But you don't, you don't see this low bait pattern to it. It's a very broad, rounded pattern. And this kind of, this suggests that it may be not, it's not related to a single volcanic eruption. In other words, it's much more consistent with being related to a sea level rise, for instance, something that cut off the prevailing deposition, which we've already seen in the, the, the middle order division happens, you know, even without ash beds in there. But if you, if you postulate that, yeah, you have the, the middle and upper order division, and there's a background rate of uh, volcanic ash input, if anything disturbs the, the relative rate of, of ash input to the, the prevailing sedimentation, then you may see an ash. 
which is actually particularly true of these, these middle order mission ones, is that with the exception of the, the Diki and the, the Millbrig, which are particularly widespread, is that a lot of them come and go. You'll see them in one spot and they won't be over here and they see them over here. So again, it kind of gives you the impression that it's the background sedimentation that permits the ash bed to be ex expressed. And again, the, the implications you have for the, this particular situation, and it's both the, the bentonite and the oil shale that's associated with it in this case. Uh, widespread uh, failure of the carbonate sedimentation. Um, the distribution of the ash is not consistent with a single event. Um, the sh associated shales, like the Glenwood that I worked on, uh, have a very high content of orthogenic feldspars in them, uh, which implies that they had an unstable precursor, in this, in this case, probably ash. And so that the presence of an organic rich mudstone may be a function of suppressed carbonate deposition due to uh, hydrodynamics and or used to see rather than increased productivity. And the question is, does this have a, a lesson for us for the Eagleford, which of course has volcanic ash in it? Well, this is something that was mentioned in the, uh, uh, the, the clay symposium, the, the mud rock symposium we had in February here in, in Houston. And one of the descriptions they noted was that the, uh, the black organic rich part of the Eagleford, the lower Eagleford, had the most ash in it, the, the most ash beds in it. It was the most eugenic and had the highest POC, which would of course be consistent with the model we were just, uh, <laughs> we were just discussing. And in fact, um, you know, so this would be consistent with the idea that the ash is better expressed in an area where you have lower backgrounds or sedimentation that it's uh, uh, competing with. Um, there is actually a, a different possible sediment or explanation for this, which I was, uh, uh, Donna Davis asked a question that was actually very pertinent to this at, at the meeting when she asked, did they ever find any uh, glass shards in the ash? And the reason that this is important is that um, Kaolinite doesn't occur in marine shales, or in marine black shales, at least diagenetically, because to form kaolinite, you have to have acidic conditions. You have to have a higher level of activity of hydrogen ions as opposed to the, uh, the other cations. And so the, the, the kaolinite that you see in tonsteins and so forth are actually in coals in freshwater environments. You can do that in a freshwater environment. You can't, you don't get kaolinite that forms from, um, uh, in a marine environment from volcanic ash. Now, that's what, what we apparently have here that, that they've described and attributed to this. But the other, the other possible explanation is that uh, kaolinite does tend to form in, in calcareous environments, uh, particularly in a, in a hydrothermal regime. And we also know that at this point in, uh, Eagleford deposition is that there were a number of submarine volcanoes that were in the area. And so the implication is that one of the explanations for this is that the kaolinite was due to hydrothermal, you know, warm waters coming up through the, the, the basinal organic rich muds and producing the kaolinite which, you know, plugs up the porosity. But the other thing it, it could potentially do is, is help for the, in the maturation of the, the organics. So it could be, uh, it's, it's pretty significant to figure out just exactly what this stuff is doing there. So by way of conclusions, um, integrated studies are necessary. In other words, just relying on one thing to tell you about the shales. You really get a lot farther down the road the more things you can, you can get into these. I'm not advocating that, you know, you have to do all these things, you know, uh, mineralogy, uh, paleontology and so forth for every well you drill, but what it, you really want to do is for at least your key wells is to try and understand them as thoroughly as you can, do, what, do everything you can, so you can cross calibrate and understand how these things are put together. Because then you can, you can map them and you can extrapolate from there, which is why, what you want to do when you have a depositional model. <clears throat> 
Um, again, you want to have a working depositional model to help you predict what you need to do to increase the efficiency of your exploration and development. Um, again, it allows targeting the appropriate methodology to what you're going to do, uh, how you're going to do it, and uh, make it fit the, the, the shales as closely as possible. Uh, biofacies and taphonomy are powerful mappable tools, um, again, for delineating the, the facies. Um, <coughs> organic matter type and abundance may be impacted by the rate of deposition. In other words, you know, don't just figure that if, you, if you've got a TOC value, it's enough. And the distribution of facies and, and unconformities have different meanings in, in low uh, deposition areas. In other words, if, if, you, if you start doing what people call sequence stratigraphy in a basin and they start looking for unconformities, they're not doing the same thing. They're not looking at <laughs> see, because half the time they're looking at uh, uh, hiatuses, they're, they're looking at surfaces of non-deposition, the other half of the time they're looking at, at an event that may or may not have any significance. Um, again, the physical properties of the mudstone, in addition to the, you know, the, the hydrocarbon properties of the mudstones, the physical properties may be in, impacted by the mineralogy and the organic matter type. Again, the particularly the land-derived humic material can give you facility. It can impact uh, the density, uh, the facility, uh, frackability of the shale, in addition to uh, impacting the um, uh, hydrocarbon potential. So, you know, it's, it becomes important beyond just the hydrocarbon issue, but the physical properties of the rocks as well. Uh, again, TOC, clays, silicon carbonate are oversimplifications. And, you know, keeping in uh, with the idea that events, you know, impact what the sediments actually look like is that mapping of the frequency of storms and events may be as important as mapping the upwells, which is what people have done for, you know, 30 years on these things. They, they map them and they say, well, the upwellings must happen here and here and here and here. But if that's not the only variable that determines whether this stuff is preserved, again, there may be more to it than that. Uh, just to summarize, the implications is that if you do this, you have the potential for predictive modeling. In other words, it'd be like basin mod and so forth. You can predict from the, the parameters that you can uh, observe. You can figure out what the, the porosity history of, of the rock was, you know, when it, uh, when it was compacted because, because you understand the nature of what was compacting when, when the hydrocarbons were being dispelled, um, you know, whatever because you'll know which, which hydrocarbons were where, uh, when the water was being expelled from the rock, uh, what the relationships were, and so forth. Um, mapping of the various parameters, again, particularly the distribution of where the sweet spots were will help you where the, the, the best, highest grade uh, organics were. And you can also, you know, again, you can map the, the uh, distribution of things like bar road zones and so forth that might contribute to your, your reservoir characteristics. The shelf facies, what you see in the shelf may help you with understand what's going on in the basin so that looking at, if you're, if you're trying to understand what's going on your, in your basin where you're, you're working on your, your uh, organic rich mudstone, looking at the equivalent unit up on the shelf can under, help you understand the relationship of the biofacies, uh, you know, relationship of the clays, how, what's, what they're looking like as they go off into the basin, the stratigraphic uh, succession and so forth. Uh, normative mineralogy, I didn't say much about this, but the normative mineralogy, which is the calculated mineralogy based on the bulk chemistry, can help you understand you know, how the minerals evolved. If you, if, you, if you know what the minerals are that you've got, 
and how they should be distributed. I was always trying to, to figure out what my clays actually looked like from the, the normative mineralogy by subtracting out everything else. So. Um, this is an observation beca because the physical properties of the mudstones <coughs> may be impacted by the mineralogy and the organic matter type. You should be able to back out into your geophysics uh, what these values are maybe from your, your geophysics. In other words, if you, if you understand how uh, your velocities, your horizontal and vertical uh, components change uh, based on the changes of the, the physical properties of the, the shales, then you should be able to, to predict that from your geophysics. You should be able to relate that. And in, in particular, where I was thinking about this was that as I said, with the, the, the fissile black shales, like in the Pennsylvanian, they're, they're highly fissile, but they have, they have low density because they're mostly <coughs> organic material. Uh, they don't have that much clay. They're not brittle. Uh, at least they're not brittle because of either carbonate cement or, or silica cement. So they basically should show up as a low, velocity, a, a low density zone. And, you know, if you, if you know, know some of these parameters going in, you might be able to, to uh, model that. And, again, the details of the clay mineralogy make a difference. Um, one of the things I should, as I conclude this, that I should point out is that I've, I've made this argument for all these different things as, as contributing to the difficulty or things you need to keep in mind in looking at, at organic rich shales, organic rich mudstones. And the, the, the message that I'm trying to convey is that there are a lot of things out there that you can do something about with that will help you understand these things. You shouldn't look at them as being complications or say, oh, it's too hard. You know, a lot of people look at paleontology and say, oh, that's too hard, we can't do that. Um, the way you have to look at it is to look at it as an opportunity, is understanding these things, and particularly the, the, how the shales are distributed stratigraphically in terms of the vertical section, in terms of the horizontal distribution, is that they're opportunities. If you understand these, if you do the work and understand them, there are a lot more opportunities out there. In other words, I'm not trying to say that, you know, all the stuff out there is, is, is bad, is that I'm, I'm actually trying to say the, the opposite, is that there's a lot more opportunities out there. You know, there's a lot more black shields that people haven't looked at that they've sort of thrown up their hands and saying, oh, it's too hard to understand these things. We don't know what to do with them. Is that if you take the time to understand them and how they work, then you can figure out where the good spots are. And this is particularly important when you think about, you know, not every, every organic rich mudstone out there is going to be a Bakken or an Eagleford. They're not all going to be that big. You're going to be looking for something smaller than that. But you can still make a pile of money out of it, especially if you figure it out before anybody else does. And so the trick is to figure it out before anybody else does. And so that's, that's where you're at. That's, that's the message is to, to look at it optimistically and look at the fact that there are opportunities out there if you know what to look for. Do you have any questions for the speaker? <clears throat> Many of them. Um, what do you think about tertiary shales or mesozoic shales? Are you eliminating them from your study? Oh, no. I'm, I'm just saying that my background is, is paleozoic. And it basically, you know, as, as you go up into the Mesozoic and the Tertiary, it becomes a lot more complex because then you have to figure out how to winnow out the organic rich, or the, 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 the shales that are black because of the, the, the humic content. And for instance, you think of your Cretaceous black shales, when, like the pier and the so forth, that are, that are uh, interior, a lot of that's gonna be um, terrestrial organics. That's not to say it's, it's, it's exclusively organics. And I think there are ways you can, you can effectively figure out where the good spots are. But it's a, it's a harder problem. And one of, one of the, the answers to that is that uh, if you think about the, the Mesozoic shales that are, like the, the Eagleford, is that they basically occur in uh, arid environments. 
so that you have a, it, it cuts down on the amount of uh, terrestrial organics that gets dumped into it. And so the eagle furred, you know, possibly like the Kimmeridgean shale in, in uh, Europe, you know, some of the other uh, black shales that are in, in arid environments, uh, the Middle East where you have the Jurassic uh, organic rich intervals, again, they're all in arid environments so that they're basically marine organics in them rather than having to compete with uh, the terrestrial organics. Yeah, Donna. Excellent talk. I have one question and possibly one comment. The question is, if you try graphing illi crystallinity against depositional rates? Well, that's, that's an, ex an excellent question. And my, my answer is that I have never done that directly um, the, because it's kind of hard to re estimate depositional rates. And one way to answer that question is, you remember the cyclothem I showed you where I had that curve, is that the reason that that works, it's actually a very unique circumstance, is that uh, during low stand in Iowa where that came from, is that there is no plastic influx during the low stand. In, in other words, all the clays that are in that section are derived from right there. And that's why it's all illite. It has no kaolinite or detrital muscovite or anything in that particular cycle then. And so you figure, well, if all the clays that are there are derived from that area, you know, how do you describe the, the depositional rate? <laughs> because basically, uh, your depositional rate is whatever your increment is of your sedimentation above the, the coal. And what you'd have to do is, is be able to figure out what your sea level curve shape was in relation to the depositional environments. And in order to do that, you'd have to have some sort of an absolute measure for uh, water depth during the high stand. And this is one of the things that, as, as somebody who worries about in, in terms of used to see that people perpetually ar ar argue about. They say, how do you know what the, 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 the amplitude of a sea level change is? And there are a lot of people that have different ideas. And some of them have you know, better ideas than others, but I've never really seen any convincing argument. And I even argue with my, my old advisor, I had an argument with him about this a couple weeks ago. Um, is whether you can actually measure the amplitude of sea level change. And I tend to be very skeptical about that. And going back to your question again, that's where the key is to figure out your depositional rates that you need to figure out what your sea level curve looks like. And my comment is the people look at ash, they look at it, they see it roughly in the same area of the section, and they say, oh, this correlates. Mm -hmm. And they do it without doing any mineralogical isotope trace or minor element characterization. The Miocene asphalt has been determined from innumerable outcrops, well cuttings, etc., to be one asphalt from one source. Well, but you look at things in the Ordovician in the Midwest eastern areas, or you look at things in the Eagle Ford, and they are assuming, that because they're the same looking uh, ash or rock with the same thickness, it's the same one. Well, that, I think it's a bad mistake. That's That's actually not uh, precisely true, is that in the Ordovician ashes, they have done that. And the the argument is, is that uh, is, are the, the, the phenocrysts that they see in the ash unique to pr a particular volcanic eruption or are they unique to a particular magma chamber? You know, because a, a magma chamber can give you com uh, repeated eruptions. Yeah. And so they can look alike, you know, if they're coming from, and that's, that's presumably true. But I, I think even in some of the, the thicker uh, Ordovician ashes, they get a couple of different uh, sets of phenocrysts, but they, ha they have actually looked at that. And the people who are in favor of that say, yeah, it shows it's, it's one eruption. Do you think there's any, <clears throat> yeah, can you document any 
unconformities in the Eagle Ford rather than hiatuses? Well, I haven't worked on the Eagle Ford enough to do. I, I'd certainly like to have the opportunity. I, I, one of the things, again, is, as Donna suggested, you'd probably want to see what you could find in terms of phenocris. I'd like to know what the background clay is in the Eagle Ford. You know, because the, 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 the notes on the, basically they've looked at the clays where they, they've had some reason to, to, well, they said, well, we've got this kaolinite plugging up the pores. I guess we've got kaolinite there. But we don't know what the background, or I don't know what background clay is. You know, what's, what's the pervading environment? And, you know, even though in the, from working in the Paleozoic, I'm used to working on, with conodonts and so forth. Presumably, as you go up through the Mesozoic and, and Cenozoic, you can do the same thing with fish. You, know, you can look for fish fragments. You could look for a, a hard ground that's you know, got a bone bed and so forth in the eagle. You could do that. Uh, I don't know that anybody has, um, because a lot of the stuff you know, is basically, you just have to do the hard work of finding out what's going on in that rock. And you know, I, made the, I made the argument, you don't have to do it in every well, but you have to do it someplace where you, so you actually have a a, a calibration point. So, and again, this, this kind of gets me back to another point I wanted to make is that it, one of the nice things about doing clays is that clays you can do completely throughout the section. You can do it in the sandstones, you can do it in the limestones, you can do it in the shales, and you can see what the clays are doing throughout the whole section. You can do that with conodonts. So that you've got a couple of things you can calibrate, you know, throughout the whole section and see what they're doing, regardless of what the, the apparent lithology is doing. And so the reason this becomes important is sometimes your sands have sharp bases, sometimes they're sharp, sometimes they're gradational. Same with limestones. And sometimes with limestones, it's apparent, it's not real. Is it, if, you, if you look at the conodonts, they're just grading from the, the shale up into the limestone. And if you look at it in outcrop, you'll say, boy, that looks like a sharp base. And you'll say, well, well it's not, it's actually gradational. So, 